All right, everyone. Welcome to our May session of 2019. And we have, we had previously had a child who left us earlier this year. And then now Jessica is one of our outgoing chairs. So that's I, how I thought that probably we have a meeting with them and get some idea on what they have done in the past, what they expect to be done in the present time, and what we are expecting for the future, like in five years or 10 years from now. So I invited Jessica and also Barb to just give us a short speech on what are the expectations, and then we all can use the information for later whoever is leading this committee as a chair so that we can all learn some good lessons from these experienced people. So, Jessica, I just give the microphone to you and we will go ahead and start. Wonderful, so thank you. you start, can, can I do an announcement that I think everybody would like to know is that Katie Huffling will be in, uh, inducted into the American Academy of Nursing. Oh my God. All. Yes, it's excellent. Oh, Amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Just found out this last week, so I just wanted to make that announcement. I don't think she's on, but um, I think that's great. So go ahead, Jessica. Well, thank you for bringing that up. So I know this is our leadership team on the phone for a planning or on the the webinar right now for a planning meeting. But for anyone who is coming back to this, this is an archived version. Um, my name is Jessica Kastner. I'm currently the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Emergency Nursing, um, the President and Principal of Kastner Incorporated, and have acted as co-chair for almost between two and three years now. Uh, first with Barb Polivka, because we had a, a staggering a staggering leadership opportunity, and now with, with the Zeta for the last year. And I know Luz is coming on then as the next co-chair to continue this a wonderful line of succession for our research work group. So um, joining me on this presentation, the next slide, please. Uh, joining us is, is Barb Polivka. And on the next slide, I have a picture of Barb and I at my induction at the American Academy of Nursing, because uh, Barb was my sponsor of uh, speaking of the Academy. So Barb, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or anyone who comes back and watches this at a later date. Sure. Um, this is Barb Lipka. I am the Associate Dean for Research at the University of Kansas Medical Center School of Nursing. Um, I was the co-chair um, for a number of years. I've been on uh, at any research uh, work group member for a long time now. Um, I think once it first starts getting going. Um, and um, was co-chair um, before um, Jessica and then with Jessica. So. I kind of have a little bit more of a history of how um, any research work group has worked in the past. And, and so I'm excited to hear what Jessica has to say. We can go from there. The next slide, thank you. So just a reminder, and I do tend to take a look at these two things before every meeting and when structuring the agenda, just to remember what, you know, where we are and to keep us focused. So the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment at this time, uh, the mission is to promote healthy people and healthy environments by educating and leading the nursing profession, advancing research, incorporating evidence-based practice, and influencing policy. Our research work group, the purpose is to frame and support an agenda for enabling nurses to solve environmental challenges through the creation of new knowledge. And so it's been a real privilege to be a part of this group by generating evidence base to create change. And as I was looking at Annie at the whole and trying to consider as a research work group, what's our niche? What do we do uniquely well? Is that Annie actually has an incredible strength in informing policy and the policy and advocacy as a group. Um, and it really was a strength. And so it's been a privilege as part of the research work group to think about how to generate the evidence then to inform that policy. 
And so this in particular, you know, if we really look at the strengths and opportunities of the organization is a place where we do thrive and have our, our skills all coalesce uh, very well. So the research methods interest group or this research work group, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments went through a restructuring and a strategic plan um, in this last year and a half. And that was a very extensive process, included workshops and several follow-up meetings with the board of directors um, and the staff and the leadership. And Barb and I were engaged in some of that um, over the years. And a big part that, that I did bring to the table and, and really went to bat for was this idea mm -hmm. that, well, uh, the, the organization as a whole is starting to organize into topical interests, um, whether that be around safe chemicals, whether that be around climate change, a really unique function that Annie served for research that is not easy to find other places in the discipline was an accessible methods interest group. So the ability to advance rigor and research design for those on research intensive career trajectories is, is a bit of a, a gap and can be difficult outside of some institutions. And so Annie served this really important purpose. And I thought that was really important to separate either as a work group or as a methods interest group. Um, why is that important? I think anytime you're doing a specific type of work, the ability to foster a community of scholars is actually essential to our collective success. And it was really necessary for a lot of the benchmarks and opportunities that I was able to achieve. We brought together nurse scientists across institutions interested in environmental health research. And that's, that's not easy to do. And I personally had spent several years looking at different research interest groups in the, the uh, regional societies and trying to find that opportunity to connect in a meaningful way with a community of scholars that really gets it, um, that understood how important environmental health was in those, those environmental health exposure measures and those initial biomarkers and the health response as something in the forefront of a program of research. A lot of people have it in the, in the background or as a particular variable or measure. But this was a unique group that enabled that opportunity to gather nurse scientists across institutions. I've been really proud in particular when we do these webinars that we've pulled in some high quality interdisciplinary collaborators. And bringing people in has actually opened opportunities throughout the Alliance of Nurses mm -hmm. for Health Organizations or continued collaborations. As an example, one of the earlier speakers that we had invited on uh, was Dr. Kevin Cromar from NYU. And we've actually continued some work together and are starting to work on a project through another committee in service. Um, and I, I think that opportunity for, for each of us to pull in some really high quality collaborators to look for additional teams, projects, and collaborations has been important. Another part too is this connection to the professional network of other communities of scholars. And I know Barb, for example, is really engaged in ASHNI and in APHA. And Azita, you know, you're involved in several nursing organizations, um, particularly around perinatal health and lose with the adolescent population. So that ability to really amplify and create this professional network um, that, that pulls in these environmental pieces I think was of true value. So I think what was important and what I was really searching for and what we were able to build with one another was this idea of how to find someone who can provide a letter of support that truly understands your expertise and what you're trying to do, both as a nurse and as a scientist looking at environmental health exposures. The opportunity to access mentorship and provide peer mentorship to one another. The opportunity for invited presentations, which as we know is important for, um, for promotion and tenure in the academic setting and to show productivity for anyone on a research trajectory. Uh, lots of co-publications, co-authored grants. We've done workshop. The idea too that I think this group has fostered is that I offer constructive criticism with the intent to foster one another's optimum trajectory 
and really amplify each other's uh, our scholarship. So that research active career trajectory requires that community of scholars to do that. You can't do it in a vacuum. Um, I know in that last bullet point, what this has created for me was a connection to the American Academy of Nursing. Um, and as you saw, Barb did sponsor my application, provided that letter of support, understood what I was trying to get at um, in a wonderful way. You know, some connections to the Council of Advancement for Nursing Science. We did a symposium there. And lots of the, the opportunities to sort of plant these seeds in our regional research organizations. What I found and what I think is a challenge for the future, as I sort of looked, looked through the past and where we are now, was I had had this need before being part of the academy, before being part of that environmental health expert panel, um, and before being quite ready to serve on an interdisciplinary environmental uh, group, which I'm serving on now. And I looked around our profession and I saw all of these truly high performing individuals with active programs of scholarship or who were prolific authors. Um, you know, Linda McCauley, who's the Dean at Emory, had quite a program of, of research with environmental component. We've had Marcy Thompson come on and talk to us about some of the work she's done with Superfund sites. Um, Bobby Berkowitz, who's a, a recent ANA president, who her name shows up on a lot of the, the publications that I've used over time that really look at what is environmental health nursing, particularly for education. Uh, there's Maureen George at Columbia, who's leading internationally on some climate change work and, and research as a nurse. Um, this last year at the Academy and at CANS, you know, there was a lot of highlight about occupational noise exposure. So in the nursing profession, we have individuals like this and had for a long time. And what I appreciated about Annie was that ability to start pulling some of us together across institutions to collaborate in this way. And those, especially with that special focus of how this would translate into a policy intervention. Um, so I think something to think about in the future is defining Annie as research to inform clinical practice. Um, is Annie that place? and sort of be this place to foster from uh, an early research trajectory through to perhaps that opportunity to serve with the academy um, to, to bring in. And so I see my role now as a, one of mentor and ability to connect that trajectory um, and find those, those nurses interested in a research trajectory who are beginning an interest in environmental health nursing research. So Barb, I, I said a lot. I don't know, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, sure, I will. Um, so, oh, the slide just went. Um, just thinking back on some of the history, just to bring everybody up to date, because I'm not sure anybody else was on. Um, I think I've seen a lot of growth and change. When we first started this group, it was just um, chatting. We'd sit and talk, and there was a lot of discussion about should we start a journal? Um, and Laura Anderco and others tried to get that together, and that really never panned out as a separate environmental health nursing journal. Um, and instead, we've got now um, a spot in AJN um, where we can publish and be. Um, you know, recognized as a, a section of AJN that their editor, Sean Kennedy, is very supportive of that. And um, many of us have published in there. And we've got another article coming out in the near future, another in the pipeline. So that's continuing. I think that started here, and I'd like to get more of that going. So I think that's, you know, that's a connection to Annie that's recognized as a collaboration with Annie and this group. Um, but it started out as, you know, well, could, should we have a separate journal? Um, now we've got um, another, uh, uh, well, I think, what is it? Um, one of the journals is going to be doing a special edition uh, related to environmental health. Um, and uh, public health nursing is interested in doing that. We've had the editor for public health nursing on um, and discussing environmental health uh, publishing. Uh, environmental health nursing publishing. Um, so early, it's, it's a lot of discussion early on was on publishing. Um, there was a lot of just sort of 
um, discussion about what people were doing and can we help you move forward in your particular study. Um, and I think the way it's evolved, and I think Jessica was, you know, paramount in getting this done, I really like it, is moving it to a little bit more focused on the methods um, as well as dissemination. So I think that growth and that change, I think, is really beneficial. I think some of the challenges is getting people to connect when they're not sure that's a method that they're doing or whatever. But um, So I think that's something we're going to have to continue to work on. Um, but I think it's the way it's been focused in the last maybe four years or so, I think, has really been beneficial. Um, and it's less, let's just chat, and really more focused on particular areas that we can go into a little more depth on. Um, and learn from each other, and as Jessica said, make connections um, or provide you know new insights into what you might do in a particular study. So that's all. Wonderful, thank you. So on the next slide, I you know I was shared on on the previous slide why Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and why the research work group was unique. And uh, for me, coming clinically from an emergency nurse, I was very familiar with environmental poisonings, um, occupational and industrial accidents in the acute stabilization phase, um, disasters. Uh, we had a lot of training on anticipating terrorist events and chemical warfare. And so I had the clinical familiarity with that type of environmental health piece when life and limb needs to be stabilized um, or is threatened. And so was very clinically aware of what were relevant measures, um, what were important life-threatening effects, what biomarkers were useful or not useful. Uh, the one we used the most was you know, measures of carbon monoxide poisoning. And so that, that was something that I was able to share um, with my emergency nursing community. Some of the background that brought me here too had to do with some forensic nursing pieces because we did gather both biomarker evidence as needed, environmental evidence that came on the person, um, as well as contributed to that thinking. And <clears throat> along the way, actually started to engage with experts in environmental crime. Um, and so that's when industry was breaking the law and how that extended that data collection and environmental nursing, forensic nursing expertise into environmental nursing was really a unique piece that it was, it was difficult to sort of bridge those two expert areas within nursing. Um, also had some training and interest, of course, in public health nursing and disaster nursing. But this idea of more slowly evolving disasters or lower levels of exposure that still have acute health effects um, as a, and long-term health effects as well, there's some expertise in people in the American Cancer Society. So it was pulling all of this together and in the clinical research studies and the population studies, looking at branching that into the exposure science piece. And, you know, was able to add several of these measures. Of course, this um, study has the measures we both developed and used. Um, you have an outdoor air monitor um, on the left there. Um, you have the VOC, you know, this one was a one hour monitor and then on BARF study, we're looking at, at longer lengths of time. Um, over on the right, there's a temperature and humidity log, the formaldehyde um, system that, that I know Karen Dana Miller presented on as well, and then particulate monitors. But what I found was when I was working in the interdisciplinary space, um, I, in particular, it wasn't well understood what I could contribute as a nurse scientist. I felt it was very well understood where I could have contributed as a bachelor's prepared research nurse or as a master's prepared, uh, someone who can communicate the translation of the findings 
But I grappled with finding a team and finding that community of scholars to help me, you know, demonstrate that I that I am an expert in these methods, how we integrate it with symptom science and with health promotion um, and with investigations of acute health effects that were relevant. And so to me, this was sort of finally the one unique place where I could coalesce this expertise again with other scholars who could get it. You know, what a PhD prepared scientist with a nursing background could contribute to uh, creating and leading research designs that included exposure science. Um, so I thought that was important, but to define us as this unique specialty and to lead as sort of a group we started some work on what's our shared philosophy? What's our shared mental model? What are our shared standards for research design within that unique body of knowledge when we're both looking at exposure science from a nursing lens, from that nursing perspective? So that's what, what really excited me about engaging with Annie and Laura and Derko, um, where I actually did both my undergraduate and my PhD work left a legacy there. I never actually took her class, but a lot of the content she developed was taught in the classes I took. So it is interesting how we, we plant these seeds and open the path for others in, in unexpected ways. Uh, so knowing now that she's doing a lot of work with environmental exposures in schools, she continues to extend that leadership as to what is, what is special as to how nurses can contribute in places where clinical nurses may be or community nurses may currently be and how we're both changing that practice on the individual level all the way up to policy on the national and international level. So it's exciting to be part of defining that and looking at what are those exposure science methods? Um, how are we pulling in the idea of um, whether it's the exposome or that mechanistic pathway as to how an exposure creates a health effect? So next slide, please. So Barb, um, this may be best actually, if, if you wanted to comment on some of the, the background documents that we use commonly. Well, the nursing and health and environment, that's a classic now. It's kind of, when you want to hear a little side story is, I gave my book away, let somebody borrow it years ago. And here at KU now, we're, we've got a, a a library, sort of a library, bunch of books and a, uh, that are displayed, and we're going through them. And I found two copies of this, and we're letting people take what they want, you know, out of this. And I'm like, oh, these are mine, you know. So now I have my copies of Nursing Health and the Environment back. Um, so that sort of set the stage for what we need to do in terms of research, practice, policy. It was sort of the, and I've had access to it online. You can download it. It's an um, IOM report. Um, and then the principles of environmental health for nursing practice with implementation strategies, ANA. I mean, Barb Statler was uh, instrument, and others instrumental in getting ANA to recognize the importance of environmental health, um, at least for a time. I'm not sure it's a priority for theirs anymore, but I think for a time it was. So that was exciting to get that. So these are two foundational documents that actually legitimize um, environmental health as a research and practice uh, and focus area for nursing. Um, and they both, you know, refer back to our founder, Florence, um, and the importance of her work. So um, we can't ignore either one of these. And ANA now includes environmental health as part of the scope and standards. So I think that's really exciting. And Annie was instrumental in a lot of that. Um, in the nursing health and environment, we used, we went back to that when Rosemary Chaudhry and I did the scoping review of environmental health research um, in nursing and went back and, and looked at what they found originally, and it was, what, 86, I think? Um, and, and the little research they found compared to what we've seen in um, published research, uh, nursing research and environmental health. It's expanded exponentially, which is great. Um, so it's good to have that background um, and to see where they were guiding us um, back then and where we are now. 
Agreed, thank you. I put these in as sort of the classic foundational documents. Something I noticed though, specific to research and research methods, is the emphasis is quite a bit on nurses and nurse scientists contributing to interdisciplinary environmental health or collaborating in these models. And we've, we're, we're carrying on and catalyzing this evolution into we are leading and defining the unique and important contributions. Um, sort of this idea of some of the documents do, the more classic documents hint as the nurse scientist or the nurse as an assistant um, or as a co-helper. And I, I've noticed too, as the evolution of the publications have come about as to have the leadership opportunities and the ability to define and see nurse scientists and environmental health as leaders in this area as well. So this next slide just demonstrates some of the work that we're doing in the present um, in this very recent year, and that's that idea of a shared mental model. We have many shared mental models in environmental health nursing. When we're looking at clinical practice, um, when we're looking at education, but these are shared mental models to guide research efforts and to coalesce the research methods. And so um, there we are presenting at um, SNRS on the bottom slide with this NIH symptom science model with environmental health. Uh, and we have that publication under review. And then on the right hand side, again, another work we're developing is how to integrate the NIEHS translational research framework to help create that shared mental model of if you are an environmental health nurse scientist, if you are in this area of research, how can you um, use these tools to communicate your, your research, what you've done, to plan your project, and to see where you fit in the translational continuum? And we do continue to have several ongoing uh, publications or previous case studies that help to apply this and to bring the strength of what we have in policy work and advocacy and in, in some of the clinical work into how are we sort of creating what that mental model is around being a research work group or using our methods. Um, next slide, please. So this is a fishbone diagram. I use this all the time uh, for change leadership and management. And I left this open uh, for Luz and Azita as you look forward, something to consider as to what might be contributing, what, what are the things that are working towards the head of the fish here, which is that mission to solve environmental challenges through the creation of new knowledge in environmental health nursing. And each of the next slides goes through these elements. We're looking at people, um, process management, measurement, machines, and material. So uh, first is people. And I love this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed, in this case, scientists can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has uh, from Margaret Mead. Um, although the original quote, of course, looked at citizens. You know, I have that very strong feeling about, about this group and what we're working to do with methods. So um, here's the team that presented at SNRS. Um, Jeannie Rodriguez and Lisa Thompson are not pictured here. So we sort of snapped it at a time when I think they weren't available. But I think a real strength and, and something to think about this is innovators and early adopters are often not a very large group. Um, last week, I was sitting in a giant conference center in Las Vegas at the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine um, with lots of attendees. And the keynote was about prevention of firearm injury. And Dr. Wintemute, who was the presenter, actually said, there were times when the panel would outnumber the audience. And he talked about how this was a group that through a drought of funding and actually policy that truly limited their funding, continued their commitment, um, continued their commitment to each other and to the work to the point where they are now. Um, and in my own, you know, in the Journal of Emergency Nursing, we are, we are creating um, statements about this. There's research coming out. There was new funding increases. So this to me was important to look at the trajectory of 
being an, a pathfinder, being an innovator, an early adopter. Um, you know, I think that there is sometimes we want to measure in attendance, um, but I really appreciated measuring the commitment and the core of the active members. And again, how we're able to amplify and synergize research. Um, in my childhood faith community, I would hear often people say, you know, the same five to 10% of people are doing all of the work, um, even at an event where you have an attendance of 500. So sometimes to, to look at it in that perspective is very helpful. In my own career, um, I started an interest as my first quality improvement project I ever took on uh, was dealing with workplace mm -hmm. violence in the emergency department. And at that time, it was kind of lonely work. I did have a manager who supported me and a few publications to back that up, but it wasn't something I let go of. Um, and it's, it, it started to echo, or there were other grassroots initiation of the same concern and some other scholars I really respect who took this on as their main program of research. So now, you know, from 2002 to 2019, what a huge difference. This is really a major topic. Um, of my organization in, the, in emergency nursing. Um, this is becoming a felony in many states to assault an emergency nurse. And so I have a lot of faith that with the type of people that we have in this research methods group, the commitment, the diversity of, and, and, and yet synergy of expertise, the tremendous impact that we've had as an aggregate and as individuals, when you look at our affiliates productivity, uh, when you look at those publications, and then those connections to the other organizations that each of us have, um, I really do see the beginning seeds of something that, I hate to say it, but it might be 20 years from now, is going to be an absolute national change. It's, it's going to inform and become very integral to what we do, if it hasn't already. Um, something about people sort of looking forward is we have diversity of thought. We have found that in our projects that we do um, strengthen each other's work with, with different perspectives and viewpoints. We focus on different areas across the lifespan, some different geography across the US, although you know there's some opportunities there. I think Annie has done a nice job really looking at racial and gender diversity, but I would also challenge this group to, or uh, racial diversity, I would also challenge this group to really look at gender diversity, which is, um, you know, it's it's a big task we have in nursing overall um, and some great opportunity here. I also think, too, as part of the larger organization, just pragmatically, that we need to be very cautious and make sure that we're really working across the political spectrum and avoiding groupthink. Um, I think that's a very important piece of being a, a research informing group. Um, I think that's important to consider all sides, you know, all sides of the evidence and where it might go and to make sure that we're actively listening um, across the political spectrum. So, Barb, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. No, I think you've said that very well. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the process, uh, we did find in the strategic plan overall with Annie, an area that, that you want to think about and improve is improved communication, improved communication with staff um, in selecting speakers um, in the strategic plan of what they're doing. We don't, I have not put together checklists as to what I did as the co-chair where I have in other areas of my life and other service. And so that might be some, some nice opportunities to think about um, creating, solidifying more of what we did. Um, Barb and I had sort of created a division of labor and then, you know, passed pieces on, uh, took on Barb's, Barb's part when she left and passed on to Azita. And so this was kind of an informal mentoring, which has worked really well. But creating those checklists as to what you're doing and how might be very helpful for future chairs. Uh, of course, we have our process for web meetings and for developing workshops, which we have a picture of here, and the process of engaging each other in co-writing publications um, and putting out together symposium presentations. And we've done a letter of intent um, and responded to requests for information for different types of research that were defining environmental health nursing research. So pictured here, we have uh, upper right, we have us del delivering one of our workshops. The lower right is the login to the any meeting. 
Um, and then there's our search and PubMed. So these are some tremendous accomplishments we've had over this time. Uh, we also do have, of course, the email listserv where the website comes out. There is a website calendar that I think would be important to think about maintaining very routinely. Um, our every other month talks, I think, have had a, a have been very beneficial to both our collaborators to have invited, invited talks on their CVs, as well as to create these interdisciplinary connections. Um, th that bringing in the Public Health Nursing Journal and AJN, so um, lots, lots of great work with that process. So here in the next slide, you see um, the management piece, and I'm just kind of talking out loud about what what I've seen as the most recent co-chair, outgoing co-chair, and what to share with thinking about that going forward. A really important aspect to the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments that I spend a lot of time doing what I would call market analysis or looking at what other groups were doing is how to integrate and separate research methods or research interest group from other anti groups, particularly because there is advocacy and lobbying happening and how that can and should work. And I do have to say I was particularly influenced um, by Ellen Lockwood from Physicians from Social Responsibility and how that was a group that didn't necessarily have a very defined research group structure, but he defined his own role um, in that, you know, bipartisan, I inform with evidence. Um, and the reason why is I feel an obligation as a research, as a researcher, to be honest about areas of uncertainty, to be honest about areas of limitations in research design. And lobbyists and advocates uh, create this very satisfying, you know, more simple tagline as to what we need or what's wrong and what's happening. And that's incredibly effective communication for what they do. And so I've grappled with this and what it means. And that was part of informing why I think it's so important that there is research representation on each of these topical areas, but also that the research methods, that there be sort of that place where there is an advocacy and lobbying, we're really focused on research and research methods. Um, the other part of the management is, of course, work side by side with Katie and with Kara. I had the opportunity to put together a policy poster with them. They were delightful to work with and have done a, a policy writing workshop with them. Um, the board of directors had really guided this new strategic plan that's in place for all of Annie. And again, we focused on methods as topical focus. And, and you know, you want to choose if you want to continue along that line. But that was sort of the piece we started. The board does approve specific activities. So when we responded as the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environment or anything that had officially that name on it, it did need to be approved with the board of directors. They are very timely about it. We just go through Katie Huffling. Um, and she takes care of that. And, and so they, they do a nice job with that. Um, and with scheduling phone calls, if you have anything. We set up this staggering term by happenstance uh, where Barb was the co-chair or, you know, the first sort of the chair of the group and then um, mentored me through the process. And, and I think that works well as you're able to find interested individuals. We just sort of took on and, and had a lot of autonomy in program planning and the tone and direction of the research group. So that's, that's been a pleasure. I think uh, communicating with, with some of the other uh, leaders of, um, you know, and you see Beth on the last slide there who had done a lot of work with podcasts with the educational work group um, and keeping that communication was, was really important. Something that came up though, that struck me when I was putting this fishbone together that I would recommend to pass along is get to know each of the board members a little better um, or whether I would like to see their bios on the website to get to understand their priorities a bit better um, would be something that I think could create some opportunities for growth. So this next slide is about measurement. How do we measure success? Tremendous. And I just looked at what Azita did recently, and and it's it's amazing. And you synergize with that with with uh, with some of the work with infrastructure there in Alabama uh, and advocating for uh, for less sewer runoff. So that was that was truly incredible, and when you look at you know Barb's work in, in scholarship and um, you know Luz's work with adolescents, it really is tremendous. Every time that newsletter comes out, what what we're doing, um, publications, presentations, grant applications, grant funding, just this ongoing commitment to methods in environmental health nursing. 
Um, the other measurement piece I've been very proud of is how we've opened opportunities for others. Uh, you know, writing letters of support for one another because you get that, you understand that specialty and can echo that for others as to where the impact is and why that's important. Again, the sponsorship into the academy, career trajectory support and mentorship. So I think those are all important pieces to keep together. Of course, the number of webinars we put on, the number of attendees, um, how they evaluate it, those are important too. Next slide. This I won't spend much time on. You know, I love it that we're mostly virtual. We have a very small carbon footprint in that way. The blog and website, I think, are some good opportunities to find that improved communication with staff um, and to increase the visibility of the research group work and what we're doing. I love how Azita has recommended um, or suggested that as people write grants, she's got lab equipment project sharing. And I know that I found that with other members of our research work group too. And of course, the other, you know, we've got this PubMed search algorithm and collection for our shared work. Next slide. And then I have materials. We do have that free book as part of Annie. It's very clinically focused. And so I don't wonder as this evolves if we aren't going to want to put together an environmental health uh, research methods resource at some point. Um, that, that I think would be a tremendous resource. Maybe, maybe not as a free book, maybe as a textbook. Um, but that would be, I think that would be crucial to continue to solidify this trajectory of environmental health research methods as, as a unique contribution to the specialty. Um, we've got some pubs in progress. We've got a great workshop curricula and some tremendous resources. Um, some connection with the PEHP and NIES with that. So looking forward. And then Barb had also encouraged when I first started as co-chair and we did this together was to get input from all of our affiliates as to what the research priorities are. And that's a, a pretty comprehensive list and that is on our website. So that's something we, we accomplished and will probably want to be refined and revised as you go on. Next slide. This is the SWOT analysis. I, I leave this here as you, as you plan and think about your opportunities for your co-chair and your next step. Um, so strengths and weaknesses tend to be internal to the group or the organization. What do you do well? What, what's kind of a, a, an opportunity to, to do? Um, where are the missing links? Where are the missing pieces? Opportunities and threats tend to be external. Um, and an example I would give you is Right now mm -hmm. in the White House Office of Science and Technology, one of their key priorities is clean drinking water. And that really does impact environmental health nursing. Although of course, on the other side, we see some of the, the EPA scientific regulations as a potential threat to environmental health nursing and nursing research. So those are some examples of, of what you might want to think about. This is a management tool, the strengths, weakness, opportunities, threats, to be really honest about where, where you can build on your strengths, and where those other opportunities are. And, and this might be something we want to workshop as a meeting to create that work group strategic plan and way forward. Um, Barb, I, I wanted to pause here and see, I kind of went through those quickly. Was there anything else? Um, no, I think one thing I wanted to stress was um, that Annie is primarily an advocacy group. Um, it really is, I think. It's really the main goal in education. Those are the real strong um, groups. Um, and so whenever there is a strategic planning process, those folks are very vocal. And so it's important just to keep the research and the research methods prominent. I think that's a challenge in a lot of ways, um, but a good one. And I think one that you know has been forefront in the last few years. Um, but I think it, it's hard. It's always hard. Um, just to keep the research methods part of it up there because the advocacy is so it's very important. We're not going to minimize that. Um, but so it's the research for which to base everything, the advocacy um, threads on. Um, so I just want to sort of caution everybody and, and make sure as you guys move forward um, that you keep that in mind, that you really have to be there at all the strategic planning meetings and as much of the um, executive meeting, you know, executive uh, group meetings, uh, the board, I think that's what they're called, the board of directors meetings, as you can um, to make sure that research isn't lost. That's it.
Yeah, I agree. And and I thought it was so special because it's something that's hard to find elsewhere. Um, you know, and the longer I go on, should you want to continue to do, uh, especially the invited talks, um, the more recommended invited speakers that can sort of create this, this collection um, to go back to, to the do an activity and to bring in the that these people with a research focused career in. So, what are some ideas about moving environmental health nursing research forward? You know, my vision for the future ahead is that this continues to be a unique and rigorous specialty area of research. And I think that this group is in such a unique position to really become this research methods group of where nursing meets exposure science. Um, and, and it's very exciting, particularly as a pathway um, into other national or international organizations like the Academy. Um, we've put a lot of this in our publication. So we talked about capacity building and infrastructure. I know the Jonas Scholars do an incredible job with the environmental focus. So how can this be expanded into specialized research training and education in a research focused training program. Um, so whether that's postdoc or PhD cognates um, or even graduate certificates in the master's level, that would be very exciting, I think, to coalesce this opportunity. Uh, we've talked a lot about methods and outcomes. And so some of the places where we've seen opportunities thus far with the expertise engaged is looking at multi-level modeling, validating survey assessments and biomarkers, Using existing data sets and leveraging that opportunity further, especially for training, and then moving our designs from correlation to causation focused research. Along the translational and clinical research continuum, continuing to test environmental modification interventions and interventions that reduce environmental exposure um, or mitigate that response, and starting to define some of those research best practices. I think there's a lot of great opportunity to grow into gene environment interaction research and to continue this work with endotype characterization. And again, that's that's part of our published work that or that, that work that's under review for publication, we hope is coming out soon. But I also think as we move forward, there needs to be a lot of thought um, as a community of scholars as to what leadership for this next generation of clinically relevant evidence and methods will look like. Or, again, as sort of this strength and weakness, the strength of this group is the methods and research to inform policy interventions. Perhaps that's the place to continue to grow. Um, but I do see as this goes on that opportunity to really look at, again, the, the change in clinical practice through research as well. So with that, there's my last slide. This was really an honor to know that, that you wanted to hear this. Um, and I, if I don't know if we want to record questions or probably go off the recording to have a dialogue. Lou sent a message, right? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was talking while I was mute. But I wanted to thank you, Jessica, and also uh, Barb for what they have done for this research group. And I think that I have, you know, that you have uh, created a really wonderful foundation for this research group and that is very appreciative and uh, Luz and I was talking we were talking that we need to give you something as an appreciation so I contacted Katie and she's supposed to send you a little of appreciation from Annie and also a little token so look for it in your in, in your mailbox and also I wanted to make sure that Barb we are trying to we are trying to actually start writing a strategic plan for this specific group so that we know we 
everyone, any trade that comes in, then knows that where, where we are and what we need to do to make sure that the research methodology and research path is not lost in this uh, in this any big advocacy group. And uh, yeah, that's that's all. And also, I want to get the opportunity to ask Luz to introduce herself. So I've been as a teacher and I've worked with Jessica for the past few months. So most of you have heard about me or have seen me in a, this webinar. But Luz Huntington, he is the new one who is coming in. And I want to give the microphone to him, to her, to talk about and introduce her so that people know her better. Luz? Uh, she said she'll have to introduce me next time. Her mic isn't working. And, uh, I see your thank you note. And it's just been such a pleasure and such an honor to connect with great folks like you guys. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that we just, I just appreciate it. And then probably we need to have another executive meeting to work on our uh, agenda for the future. And I really appreciate you both doing such a wonderful job. and putting a great foundation to this research group. So um, good luck in the future. I plan to continue to connect whenever I can. So um, hopefully you'll have a lot of good presentations in the fall. Are you going to planning on meeting over the summer? Liz and I were talking easy earlier, and she didn't think so, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, probably maybe take June and July. But I think that we have actually we have a speaker for June, so probably we take July off and then start from August again. Okay. 